Hello, Livingston, and welcome to our ongoing series of live programs here on Livingston Education, where we love to celebrate and highlight students and the amazing things they are doing. I'm Mike Raymer, and we have a very special guest with us today, Krishna Bhatt. Krishna is a senior at Livingston High School, class of 2022. Welcome, Krishna. How are you doing today? I'm doing quite great. Thanks for inviting me here today. Ah, great for you to be here. Krishna has written and published a short book titled, What If? Alternate Histories, which has a very cool, interesting theme and which we'll talk about. For all watching, please comment and ask questions in the live stream, and we'll do our best to answer them in a Q&A at the end of the program. So Krishna, tell us about yourself, your family, and your time in Livingston Public Schools. Let's start from the beginning. Where were you born? I was first born in a hospital in Jersey City, and then I uh, we moved four days or a couple of weeks right after I was born to live to Union, New Jersey, and then uh, I went to a school, a private school in Springfield, and then I moved to Livingston. Ah, so about how old were you when you moved to Livingston? What grade were you in? I think I was I was in I was starting fourth grade when I moved to Livingston, so it was within the summer. Ah, about fourth grade. So yeah. what school did you go to? I went to Burnett Hill Elementary School for fourth and fifth grade. Ah, Burnett Hill. Yeah. Do you happen to remember your teacher in fourth grade? I I remember her name started with an L, but I remember that uh, I had a new teacher in fifth grade. Her name was Miss Nzari. I think she's married, though, so her name might be something else. Very good. But, yeah, it was great times there. Super. So then, of course, you went to M MPM. Yeah, MPM, uh, Pleasant Middle School, and then Heritage, and then now Livingston High School. Livingston High School, and you're a senior. Yeah, I'm a senior. <laughs> I can't believe it myself. Getting getting excited to graduate this year, yes? Yeah. It's crazy. Like, right before the entire pandemic, I was just a sophomore. So my real, my only real high school year was freshman year, which is just like mind boggling. Like I can't believe I'm a senior. It's hard for me and a lot of my friends to believe that sometimes actually. So yeah. And we'll talk more about it. So let's talk a little bit about your family, your mom and dad. What are their names? Oh, my dad's name is Pranay Bhatt. Uh, and my mom's name is Twinklebot. Ah, yes. Uh, what did they do? What does your mom and dad do during the day for their jobs? My father is a physician. Uh, uh, he's he operates in uh, Union, Newark, and Newport mostly, and he runs several practices in those uh, areas. And my mom helps him with his work. So yeah, very good. And did your mom, when we talked prior to the program, your mom was a teacher, is that right? Oh yeah, she was a she was formerly a teacher before she got married and came from Gujarat, India to uh, the United States in 2000. And then four years later, they she had me. And between those four years, she was, uh, I think she was a medical technician for a little while, so Great. yeah. And Krishna, you have, you have siblings, yes? Yeah, I have a younger sister named Haley Bot. Haley, very Haley, nice. yeah. yeah. Like so, the Haley so. comment, but <laughs> with an A, with an I instead of two L's. Very good. And so your nickname is Krish, right? People call you oh, Krish. People call me. People with my peers in school tend to call me Krishna because that is a very unique name, and it distinguishes myself from another Krish in my school. Uh, but at home, I usually go by Krish. So it really doesn't matter to me whether you call me Krish or Krishna. I prefer both. Very good. Yeah. Krishna, you could call me Mike. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, I will do that. I'll do that. Yeah. So you have a younger sister who's a sophomore at LHS. Mm -hmm. and yeah. Senior. So let's talk about your book. I think it's amazing. You've written a book and we'll talk you know, about it and so forth. Where did your inspiration come from? What inspired you to write the book? Okay, so what inspired me to write my book um, was a mixture of various things. One being, of course, my wonderful teachers, um, my most, my most impressionable, like the most, te the teacher that had the greatest impression on me was um, a teacher named uh, Stephen Scheibel. 
he was very outgoing about history uh, when I had him in ninth grade for Modern World History Honors, and I had uh, had him also in 11th grade for AP World History. And uh, he kind of brought my, my desire and my knowledge about history to new lengths, uh, and he also inspired a desire to explore and really go out and think about history. And other inspirations include um, a bunch of movies, actually, like 1984, um, and also the there's this one movie called Mr. Nobody, where it has this old man who knows all the pathways of his uh, future life. So it turns out that he can go back in time to a certain decision and change a certain event whether he goes with his divorced mother or divorced father, or whether he marries this one girl or this other girl, and it just opens so many pathways, which I thought was so inspiring. So it got me thinking, if I merge alternate pathways with alternate histories, then there's so many stories that I can create. And also, like, it's a fun way of thinking about it. Like, let's say, um, let's say for example, 9-11 did not happen. I know that it's a very fairly recent event, especially the far scope of history, but it will change so much about everything since all fields in the modern era are interconnected. So social media would change, uh, homeland security especially would change, and especially US and world uh, diplomacy would extremely be uh, changed. So that was kind of my inspiration for my book. It's a very cool theme when you talk about time, right? And, and yeah. just decisions that are made through history and how it might change the course of history do you have a copy of the book that you could hold up oh yeah book? right here yeah hold it up there you go, there you go. what if alternate alternative alter histories yeah, yeah my history. background's yeah there you go so and and i have a copy too it's a short book it's about 34 pages mm -hmm. and it's divided into three sections right three different points in time and history which is pretty cool Yep. Yeah, it's divided into Alexander the Great, uh, Napoleon the Great, um, and the Boston Tea Party. Yeah. So, yeah. Alexander the Great. And I learned a lot from reading your book. And it's neat. It brings me back to my time in school and history. So Al Alexander the Great, he lived, and his time was uh, BC, right? What, about yeah. what, what year? Uh, I think it was um, 330 BC. It was a very extremely long time ago. 330 BC. So tell us about, so again, your, the theme of your book is uh, famous people in history mm -hmm. and they, they are making decisions. And if a key decision uh, was made differently, it would change and alter the course of time, right? Yeah. So for example, Alexander the Great. Tell us about that pivot point that you write in your book where if Alexander did something differently, it would have changed the, the pathway. Alexander. Okay. So of course, I don't want to give too much away, but what happened is Alexander the Great, when he was leading his army um, to conquer the rest of uh, modern day Turkey, he had to face the Persian Empire, which was a behemoth in the ancient uh, world. So he wasn't like his state of Macedonia wasn't really considered a black horse at all. And also it wasn't, it was considered an upstart because he had to deal with uh, problems at home and he had to especially deal with a main problem that plagued so many other countries for centuries on um, supply chains. So he was so deep in enemy territory and also back then you can't really you don't have that form of transportation that's so fast that you can get supplies so easily so it took a long time for him to get supplies from back in greece to the front lines in anatolia so it that was a major turning point uh, for the persian empire and also for alexander the great because if the persian empire had done something different um, instead of letting uh, Alexander the Great pillage the cities of Persia, then it would have been more different because then 
the Persians would have a very, very strong chance of winning, and Alexander the Great would have virtually 0% chance at emerging victorious against the Persians, after all. Uh, consider that, considering that they're, like, such a big power in the ancient world, it was kind of, in, it seemed impossible for the Persians to have, like, de been defeated by Alexander himself, since, like, they were so big, and that was, there was also this overconfidence and this arrogance that, oh, this is such a minor country, why should we really take him so seriously? So, if that event, if their stance towards Alexander had changed, then all of history would have changed, because... What happened as a result of Alexander winning, um, in like the winning over the Asian the Persian Empire was that Greek culture became became very, it became very spread out through Asia and also through Europe, and it created a bunch of cities like in Egypt. There's Alexandria, and there's a ton of cities actually in the Middle East named named after Alexander himself. So that, of course, would have changed. And also, there's all of Western civilization, which is so ba deeply rooted in uh, Greek culture, especially from Alexander the Great's time. And there was also a bunch of incredibly influential figures that it looked to Alexander the Great as inspiration. For example, Julius Caesar, who always compared himself to Alexander the Great, and he kept on saying, oh, I can never be as great as Alexander the Great because I could not match his achievements at such a young age. He was 20, by the way, when he first started conquering, and he ended uh, his entire um, conquering at uh, the age of 30, which is incredibly incredible for someone so young. It, it is amazing. Yeah. Wasn't too much older than where where you are. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's interesting to think of history that way because if the mm -hmm. Persians had conquered, then their culture and art and history might have spread w westward, right? To yeah, the yeah. In this in right? this conflict, yeah, in this conflict, we see a east versus west scenario, which isn't really that prevalent throughout history, but when it is, it's so significant, especially with Alexander the Great's conquests. Because of him in conquering the rest of um, modern, mo mo rest of the ancient Asian world, we see kind of a spread of Greek culture and the significance of Greek civilization, which later on became this massive group of states that were ruled by Greek rulers. So it's just exciting to think about what would have happened if all of that never happened. Like back then, religion was a very, very influential factor. So religion would change, literature, uh, culture, scriptures, especially sculptures, um, and obviously buildings. So there's so much that could have been changed. And since it's such a long time ago, it just changes everything about the present. So we would be living in not even a dystopian world. It would just be so far from dystopia that we would you can't even imagine what world we would be living in if that actually happened. Very interesting to think about. Again, your what if themes, right? Points yeah, what if. So tell us about the second part of the book. That focuses okay. on Napoleon. So that would, of course, be, what time frame is that? That's is that the early eighteen hundreds in oh, Europe? Oh, that is the late seventeen nineties through early eighteen hundreds. So about um, seventeen ninety to eighteen twenty ish. So tell us about that second part of the book with Napoleon. If he had made a different decision, or there were some different outcomes, and then the pathway in history that that would have taken. Talk to us about that here. Okay, before I get into explaining Napoleon, I kind of have to explain my not so much idolization of him, but my respect for him. Because what happened was, he was an immigrant from the small island of Corsica that France had just recently conquered. And after being sent to military school where he was bullied for his ethnicity, he managed to rise from just a uh, soldier, a common soldier in the French Revolution to a, uh, I think it was a, um, some sort of commander and then he eventually ended up getting into politics and he became emperor of france which is just mind-blowing because it's such a momentous rise especially for an immigrant of who came from a very foreign country and was who wasn't really accepted by the french people at that time so i 
I idolize him a lot, especially considering that my family came from India during the 90s and had to kind of didn't he didn't they didn't we didn't experience such a momentous rise, but it's kind of inspiring. Um, anyway, uh, going back to the question, um, Napoleon, uh, because he was such a very, very strong strategist, he was able to defeat a lot of European countries and create um, the new French Empire, which was a very massive state that controlled nearly all of Europe at its peak. And the major events that I discussed in my book were the uh, attack on Russia and the uh, attack on Spain. So I don't want to give too much detail, but what happened was Napoleon's infamous for his uh, attempted evasion of Russia, and that kind of got the name of that kind of got the saying that you never invade Russia during the winter because the winter really kind of messes up your enemies, especially if you're Russia, and that works to the Russians' advantage. And we also see that later in World War II with Hitler. They tried to invade Russia. It never goes to plan. So Napoleon kind of created that whole idea that you never invade the Russians during winter. And then um, I discussed if that event had not happened, then what would have came about of his victory? And I also talked about Spain. So what happened was Napoleon initially was allied to Spain, and then due to some problems with Spain, uh, he had to invade it, and he made his brother uh, the king of Spain, and that led to another uh, lot of lot of chaos in Spain. So he had to he had a, he made a very wrong decision in approaching that idea, um, and the Spanish people they retaliated against Napoleon, and that eventually also led to his failure of conquering Russia and the rest of Europe. And ultimately, those two events are the what I consider the most, the most important failures of Napoleon in his campaign that led him to suffer defeat at the end. So I like to talk so much about Napoleon because he was so close to victory. He nearly had all of Europe in, his, in just his hand. He had the fanatic... Uh, French people that adored him, and he also was beginning to consolidate a lot of power in Europe, and he scared all the other European monarchs as well. So I was just so curious to see what would happen if such variables did not come in Napoleon's way and allowed him to have victory, because he often, like a lot of other rulers uh, previous that succeeded him and were preceding him, he had this idea, uh, this dream of recreating the Roman Empire, which was a very, very common theme. Uh, like there was Charlemagne who tried to create the Roman Empire, but it wasn't really Roman, and he created the Holy Roman Empire, which wasn't really holy either, and so on and so forth. So Napoleon, like if those events had not occurred and he had won, it just presents such a various, like very different outlook on uh, history as we know it, especially modern world history, since that's so close to um, the two thousands. So, yeah. In time, the pivot point. If Napoleon hadn't done what, it would have changed the course of things uh, about deciding to in invade Russia, or was it Spain, or a combination? The thing oh. about these events, Mike, is that there. Not necessarily if one hadn't happened, the other would not be as like big of an impact. They're both chained together in the course of history because history is history flows like a river of time, right? So you can't necessarily have any departures away from the river of time for like another another pathway to emerge because just because one pathway emerges, it may lead to the same pathway. So for example, if I decided not to do something earlier this morning, it doesn't mean that my whole day would have gone differently. It might have gone the same way. So what I'm really considering here by what if is a hypothetical scenario where if this event had not happened, then what could have happened if everything had not been such a very big variable? It's a, such an interesting theme. I'm, I love the time themes, you yeah. know, like Back to the Future. And Respect, yeah, I love that film too. Each of our lives, right? What if, if we had married a different person or we did or did not have kids or we lived in a different place? 
life is a series of opening up doors. You open one door, yeah. the pathway. And I think the theme of the book is really cool. So Krish, tell us about the third part. This is the final and third part, right? It was about, it was in the American Revolution. And the central figure you talk about is the American Patriot. Yeah. Yeah. So what happened um, was like the Boston Tea Party in Massachusetts uh, in the Boston Harbor. So a bunch of American patriots, they dressed up as Indians and they threw the British tea off the ship into the Boston Harbor, which was this big event that caused uh, British opinion and American opinion of their relationship together to change. So I like to and visualize what would have happened if that event necessarily didn't happen. Uh, but like what I said earlier, there's a very chained event. Uh, like you can't necessarily remove the Boston Tea Party and expect the American Revolution to have gone much, much differently because the American Revolution may not have happened, but at the same time, it could have happened, but a little bit differently. So the level of deviation from regular history would just be very random and i can't really predict that so what i'm trying to do is just create this virtual simulation of what could have happened in my head and create a story off of that which is what i hope my young readers uh, learn how to do because this is just an amazing and kind of creative and interactive way to think about history i don't want my readers to necessarily think of history as just numbers and names but rather stories that they can create based on events that are like so significant like what could have happened? Like what ifs, which is the main point of my book. And again, I learned a lot, it brought me back to my times of learning history in high school and college. And you know, I, I, from reading your book, I looked up what, what events caused the American revolution. And there were about seven of them. And the Boston Tea Party, of course, was among the top three. But talk to us a little bit about that pivot point in your book, if you could share that. What if, uh, I think it's kind of neat. Uh, what happened? The, the British closed down the port of Boston with the Tea Party, right? And if, one- Yeah. So the British actually initially closed down the Boston port, but instead of necessarily harming the perpetrators, they decided to suppress all of colonial America. So with punishing all of colonial America, this there was like no leniency in terms of the British Empire and the Americans, the American colonists thought that they were being suppressed by the British, which led to this massive, um, massive rise of unfeeling uh, part of like the British Empire. So if this if the Boston Tea Party hadn't happened and the Boston Harbor was not locked down, then uh, something different might have occurred. And this is like the variable. I'm, ta- I'm taking out the variable of the Boston Tea Party and right. seeing what would have happened afterwards. Interesting to think about through history. So that's sort of a synopsis of your book. Uh, I want to discuss your book a little more, but first let's have a different section, get to know you a little better and the viewers to know you, because I think you have such an interesting background. And yeah. are you ready, Chris? This is called our lightning round. Very simple. Yeah, I'm ready. You ready for this? I just ask a few different questions. First word, the answer that comes to your mind for, uh, for our viewers to get to know you a little bit. So what's your favorite color? Oh, my favorite color is purple. 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 Ah, my mom's favorite color also. <laughs> <laughs> what's your favorite food? My favorite food, I would have to say noodles. Noodles. Any kind of noodles, like flat noodles or like spaghetti as a noodle? Mm, kind of, I would, I, it's like this special type of very, very spicy noodles. It's called Hakka noodles. Ah. Yeah. Okay. It's well, just the spiciness that I like. Spiciness. Very good. Yeah. So what's your favorite holiday? My favorite holiday? Uh, if this was me 10 years ago, I would say my birthday. But now I would have to say the new year. Because, <laughs> yeah, it's a new beginning. <laughs> and while we're on that topic, uh, talk to us currently uh, celebrating Diwali, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, talk to us about Diwali. Educate our, our, our viewers a little bit. Uh, it started it's started this week, yeah? Talk, talk yeah. about Diwali. So 
Um, Diwali is known as the Festival of Lights, and it's one of the major festivals celebrated by Hindus, Jain, Sikhs, and some Buddhists. And the festival usually lasts about five days or so, and is celebrated during the Hindu lunar solar month called Kartika. Uh, the Hindus have their own special calendar, and this month falls between mid-October and mid-November. And the thing about Diwali is... Um, that the intent and what we celebrate differs a lot based on the region that you live in. So, for example, uh, my family, we come from Gujarat, and we celebrate it from November uh, 4th to around November 9th or so. And that kind of changes how, like, what we celebrate exactly. But what Diwali kind of commemorates for us is the return of uh, Lord Ram, who is this heroic figure in the popular scripture called the Ramayan, and his return from all the uh, various uh, journeys and his, ver his close call with death while fighting demons, while fighting evil, and while fighting ignorance. So Diwali, for all Hindus, tends to kind of represent the victory of light over darkness, good over evil, and knowledge over ignorance. Very good. Well yeah. said. Thank you, Krish. And I know so many in our town in Livingston are celebrating Diwali. So happy yeah. Diwali, all watching. So back to the lightning round. You ready? I'm ready. Favorite class in LHS? I think I know, but let me ask you. <laughs> My favorite class in Livingston High School was AP World History Modern. Fantastic. Did you know, have you taken other AP history classes? Uh, yeah, I've taken A push. AP hey. U.S. History, for those who don't know what that means. And your teachers in those? Sorry? Your teachers. Who, who teaches those classes? Oh, uh, I had Mr. Bisconti. He was this new AP teacher, but he was, he, was very, he was very fun with history. Let's just say that. He had a very, very outgoing personality about history. He made us laugh a lot in class, and he had very he had a very outgoing personality. So I loved A Push as well. So I'd like kind of make that my second favorite class in LHS. Made it fun, and they yeah. and they had a very quick rate in the AP classes. I know that, and they mm -hmm. prepared well for the AP exams. Yeah, so though I took these courses in uh, COVID and it was all virtual, I feel like the impact didn't really diminish if I was in, in person either because it was just like the teacher's personalities kind of like kept me going and kind of really got me more and more into history. That's so uh, great to hear. Yeah. Great, great to hear. So lastly, your favorite thing to do outside school? My favorite thing to do outside school um. My favorite thing to do outside of school is mostly reading. I have a huge hobby for reading, especially when I was a kid um, uh, in Burnett Hill, actually. I used to bring back uh, books from the library and books from my teacher's classroom, and I would just spend like five hours just reading the entire book and then doing my homework, which tended to be a difficult task since it was like already like seven o'clock. <laughs> so yeah, your screen background look at all those books in your back yeah <laughs> gracious reader great to be and you know you see my screen background why i chose it right you're talking about pathways taking mm -hmm. different paths from your book yeah. in in uh in history so i thought this is interesting for a screen background but let's get back to your book uh so you wrote and published your book right mm -hmm. tell us about briefly how you went about you wrote your book and how did you publish it? How did you create the 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 hard the hard copy? How'd you do it? So I started writing the book um, in around mid eleventh grade, and this is during COVID. So I got inspired by AP World History and AP US History to kind of combine um, Napoleon and the American Revolution into my book. And also Alexander the Great kind of was this character that I already knew about. So I decided to write about him. Um, and to those that want to publish a book, it's a very long and difficult process. And I asked, like there was, I was volunteering at the library during the summer and then there was this 
author um and also he was also an illustrator that i asked and uh i asked him for tips and it was kind of his advice also combined with um the advice of a couple of mentors that really helped me with the entire process um the most difficult part with for me was not actually writing the book but it was more so getting the illustrations um i contacted so many people for the illustrations but many of them would not be able to meet the right requirements that i wanted so i ended up creating a rough draft and sending it to several illustrators which so it was mostly to no avail but luckily i found this one illustrator in india and she helped me with the illustrations and then i got my book published by a company called outliers publishing very good so in the end it all worked out what i would say to young illustrators and young authors is to always trust the process you can you can go through the process and though it may seem bleak at times just always have faith that everything will work out because that was my experience. I always I kept on falling. I was I kept on being very sad about not having my book published and not finding a proper illustrator, but I ended up trusting the process and it all worked out. So, yeah. Well, it's a great product. I was going to ask you about the illustrations. I think it's just fabulous how yeah. Drive, not only in the words but also the pictures and the story, the colorful images really play very well. Uh, so what what are the age what's it the age appropriate for this book? What uh, ch children of what age? I am tending to direct this um, book towards children that are in elementary school because I want to cultivate this interest in history and this different way of thinking about history in young minds. So they are greater, they appreciate history throughout uh, their academic uh, careers and pursuits. But I really don't have a very limited target audience. In fact, I think everyone can read my book. Like this is just discusses various points in history that like you've said a lot of times you've learned so much about. So in reality, anybody, adults, children, teenagers, they could all read my book and uh, they would end up benefiting from it. I agree. I enjoyed it, as I said to you. And so now where are you marketing it? How are you getting the word out on it? Uh, it's selling on Amazon. I understand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, any other uh, paths, any other marketing places that you're, you're uh, trying to sell the book? Oh, uh, I'm spreading the word on Facebook a bit by bit. Um, and yeah, my, I was considering to donate most of my profits to various charities, but the problem is my father wants me to gain the money in order to pay off his expenses because he paid for my book. So uh, <laughs> I have to try to market this more and get the expenses before getting my profits and sending them off to charity. So we'll see how that goes. <laughs> Thank your dad for that. You're also still learning about the business end of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is a very new experience and it kind of lead me, led me to like this entrepreneurial um, kind of background that I kind of considering to have in my future career since entrepreneurship is such a major part of just everything of, of business and of, um, my first, my future pursuits, since I'm considering to be either a doctor or go into law. So. Ah, very good. Any other books that you might think about writing in the near future? Um, well, actually in ninth grade, I created a poetry book as part of, uh, my class, and I was considering to publish. I was considering publish publishing that by the end of this year. But I was also considering uh, creating another what ifs book, um, and using. I think I would use like other ancient characters, especially in Asia, which isn't really that focused in um, our school's curriculum. So, I'm planning to publish at least one alternative history book by the end of December. Hopefully, we'll see how that goes. Fantastic, fantastic. So, you know, Krish, what I wanted to also mention, and we talked about uh, prior in preparing for the program, mm -hmm. uh, your sister has been involved with a social cause, right? Can you talk to us a bit about that for bone marrow donations? Okay. Um, well, of actually, um, she is currently doing a fundraiser for uh, disabled children in slums across um, Gujarat, India, because 
Um, disabled children, they are at such a huge disadvantage compared to other children in the area because of their lack of family interaction, their lack of social uh, interaction because of their ostracization due to their disabilities, and also because of um, their inability of being able to work. So because of like their disabled disabilities, some most of them are not able to get a job. And since jobs are very, like there's a lot, there's like less demand for jobs and the com competitiveness of jobs are so high in India, especially, it's very hard for um, these disabled children to really get a strong foothold in life. So my sister, after um, seeing and uh, don't, helping out these disabled children in India, decided to create a fundraiser with an organization that cares for these disabled children. And uh, I think she, she has a $2,000 goal and she's reached half of it, which is just amazing. And I, I hope she, she's probably going to go through a different pathway as me. Maybe not an author, but we'll see how she goes. Yeah, I wanted to bring that yeah. up. I'm very proud of her. Yeah, as I'm sure your parents are proud of both of you, uh, you and your sister. Your sister again, Haley, yes? Haley, yeah, Haley Bot. Yeah. Haley, if you're watching, hi, thank you. And also Krishna's parents, hi to everyone. Uh, and thanks so much. Chris, for, for going through that. You know, I just also want to give a shout out to Fal Pandia. Fal, if you're watching, you know, Fal connected us together and thought that you would be great uh, to bring aboard, interview, and talk about your book. So thank you, Fal. And yeah, Chris to the community. Uh, she, really, she really kind of um, inspired me in like other events because I've also worked with her for a Ram Iron event which really drew my closeness to religion and also uh, with other events like the International Yoga Day event um, that we held in June. And um, the uh, there's a bunch of other events that I've helped her with, especially Religions of the World, where we both connected. So it's mainly due to her that I was kind of pursuing, I was really considering to write a book about history. And thank you to my, uh, my thanks a lot to my, uh, family members and my friends that have also inspired me. So, what's well, an yeah. exciting time of life? You know, uh, you're going to be graduating from high school. Soon. Yeah. Touched on that. I was wanted to ask you, what do you aspire to be, or what do you look forward to? Well, let's talk about, say, a college major. And if you're undecided, that's fine. But what what would you like to study in college? Okay. Well, considering that I've made a history book. I am majoring in history, <laughs> no surprise there. And I'm also considering to either double major or minor in religious studies or international relations. I haven't really decided that, but it's either gonna be one or the other. Chris, do you speak other languages besides? Uh... Yeah, I speak uh, Gujarati at home uh, and I have, a, I can understand Hindi, but I can't, really speak it that well or write in it neither i can i write for gujarati either so if you major in history in college any specific areas of history any uh centuries or points in time and what fascinates okay. you uh what fascinates me really is um ancient history and especially asian history because asian history isn't really that formally discussed in um, our school's curriculum. And though I do blame the education system for leaving out such a important piece of global history, um, I they can't really do anything about it because history is just so huge and you'd have to create another new course for it. So I was planning to explore that uh, unknown field that I feel like is so important to my identity as an Asian and also as uh, just as a history major and a curious uh, scholar. So Asian history and also ancient history, because ancient history, like Asian history, isn't really that formally discussed. It's kind of glossed over uh, in school. So I want to also study that because it's just so interesting. Like you have, I wouldn't, I would have never learned about um, Alexander the Great as deeply as I've learned about it, like by myself. And also I would never learned about, uh, such like great empires, like 
the Carthaginian Empire and the Roman Empire, which was, like I said earlier, uh, it's briefly discussed, but not formally in so much depth that I would like to and have uh, learned about it. Very interesting. Well, depending on which college you go to, many allow you to design your own major. So that might yeah. be- that, to- that might be, that, that would be great, yeah. I'm applying to several of such colleges, so we'll see how that goes. Yeah, wish you the best on that. Thank uh, you. Yes. So we're coming toward the end. And Krish, this has been uh, fantastic. I uh, really enjoyed getting to know you. You're well-spoken, bright, uh, Livingston Public Schools, doing a wonderful job uh, with their students. And uh, it's great to meet you and get to know your family a bit. So let's take a look at the live stream and see any questions that have come up and see if uh, people have asked you, different questions. And if you're listening, if you have questions for Krish, please go ahead and ask them in the live stream. Getting some wonderful comments here. People are very proud of you, Krish, from your grandparents. Uh, Really wonderful comments that you could look at after the show. Uh, Here's one from Monica Gupta. What if Darius won the Battle of Issus? Am I pronouncing that right? Yeah. How would it affect art and culture? So um, Darius, for those of you who don't uh, understand who that is, um, he is a, the Persian uh, monarch at the time. He was the Persian emperor, I, I believe. Um, so if he had won the Battle of Isis, then, um, like I said earlier, um, I'm not too sure whether or not history would deviate so strongly because there might be a chance for Alexander the Great to have a strong comeback. But at the same time, if he had won and everything had gone according to plan and Darius had managed to beat Alexander the Great, then we would have seen the um, the suppression of Greek culture and the ascension of uh, Persian culture, which would have been more well known uh, across the globe. And instead of like learning Latin and learning Greek, we would be kind of more Persian and Asian oriented. Ah, very good. And, and other questions coming in. Uh, we, we touched on this, but where can we, where can people find and purchase the book? You mentioned it's on Amazon, right? <laughs> yeah, it's on Amazon. Uh, I believe there's a link on Facebook for the book, if you would like to buy it. After the program, we can put the link into this live stream. We're happy to yeah. do that. Yeah. Uh, here's a int- good question from uh, Manila Argawal, if I'm pronouncing your name correctly. How can I get started on writing a book? Actually, um, I've always wanted to write a book. Um, my mom has always told me that ever since I was, I was little, I started reading books and I started writing books. Like It was like these short books with uh, stick figures. And um, I've... Haven't I was like really hesitant about writing a book because I thought it was such a big complex progress process, but um you could really start writing a book anytime, just start writing about what really interests you, and over time you would, though you might have some writer's blocks, you might not have the inspiration to continue on. Just trust the process, and eventually everything will be fine. Uh, what I did was. I was I wanted to write a book ever since, like I said earlier, ever since I was a kid, I ended up writing my poetry book and I took a this was like a core, this was within the creative writing class that I took in ninth grade. Um, I really didn't know why I took creative writing at the time. I feel like it was because I wanted to kind of have like this easy elective. But it turned out to be so influential in my writing and also with like writing a book because our teacher, uh, she's retired now. Her name was Miss Rothbard. She really just gave us assignments and gave us so many examples of students writing such wonderful uh, literary pieces of work that I was like, oh, I might as well do my own book because this doesn't seem so hard. So yeah, you can start your book, start writing your book anytime. Uh, you just start writing and see how it goes. <laughs> So, Krish, this book, by the time you started to, you sat down and you put the first words, as they say, pen to, pen to paper, right? You started writing it to the completion when you had the final product. How much time? It took, 
I can't really give you the exact date, but around a year or so. Yeah. All right. But that was because I was actually very lucky uh, cons- compared to most. Uh, so for most people, it w- I think it would take one and a half years. So yeah, uh, it depends on how lucky you are to find a publisher and an illustrator. But if you don't need an illustrator, then your book, it, like, it might be uh, easier to publish. Uh, but it also depends on the length of your book. Like if you have an entire like 200 pages or so, then it might take longer. Uh, so yeah, I think it's uh, one to two years at most. Fantastic. So we're coming to the end of the program. And again, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and sharing your background and your your uh, personal background and your journey. And it's exciting being senior year and yeah, colleges, you're going to be <laughs> colleges soon and all that good stuff. So let me ask, as we wrap up here, what are some words of wisdom that you might give for younger kids who might be watching with their families, say kids in middle school or ninth or 10th graders, okay. any, uh, any, any, you know, what, what you learned and <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I forgot to mention this earlier, but I also do fencing. It's one very, very strong hobby of mine. And, um, I fence both in school and outside of school. And the most important person in fencing has been my, uh, coach, my club coach. His name is uh, Nick Vimero. And what he always tells me, he always tells me, Chris, trust in the process. He, Whenever I do something wrong or I'm feeling down after losing a competition, um, which I've always done, I've never seemed to have like won a single fencing competition. He always tells me to trust in the pro- process because he feel he knows that I'm insecure about a lot of things and I'm nervous about fencing. Like, what if I mess up? What if I get injured somehow? He, no matter what, he always tells me, trust in the process, trust in the process, trust in the process. And like I've said earlier throughout this interview, trust in the process. That would be my advice for nearly everything. No matter it be school, no matter it be coursework, no matter it be uh, romantic pursuits (laughs) even, always trust in the process. There is always a conclusion, whether it be good or bad. So never be hesitant to try the process because if you don't try the process then your dreams will just remain dreams and it won't be reality great advice great ideas and thank you again for being here and sharing those words of wisdom and also your book and hopefully many people will buy your book and learn from it as i did so uh, let's sign off for now uh thank you everyone for for watching and joining in and commenting uh very excited for Krish and his family. Must be proud of him. And yeah. future. Krish, have a wonderful evening and we'll give the wave. See you, see you later. And if I can uh, assist with anything in the future, you just let me know. All right. Okay. Thank nice. you so much for inviting me here for this interview. It means a lot to me. Good night, everyone. <laughs>